Jim, we can't hear the music. What'd you do to it? Oh, 
Just let it, just let it be hell. You know what you are, you know what you are. So listen up, Buster, and listen up, good. Not wishing for bad luck and dark, all the way. Just let it, just let it be hell. You know what you are, you know what you are. So listen up, Buster, and listen up, good.
Good afternoon, and welcome to the Osher Theatre World production of Tiny Beautiful Things. We thought it would be useful to reiterate the heads up in our playbill. Zoom is a new challenging game for us, and it keeps showing us new tricks. One of the tricks, and some of the tricks that we can share with you, are to have you put on your gallery view rather than speaker view in your upper right hand Zoom screen. And the second thing is that you may want to modulate your volume, which is on your own computer, uh, as best you can to get the best sound possible for each individual computer. And sometimes, less often now, thank goodness, the screen freezes or the sound ceases. Please hang in there with us as we work frantically to bring the video or the sound back, hopefully returning as soon as possible and starting where we left off. But let us begin. The scene is Cheryl Strayed's home, which he shares with a husband and two children. It is late at night and the house is quiet. Cheryl has put her children to sleep and just come down the stairs. It's been a long day and she's tired. She makes her way through the living room, throwing dirty clothes in the basket, picking up toys from the floor, and sitting down at her small, crowded computer desk, where she's writing her second book, a novel, on her ever-present yellow pad. Hi, it's been a while since we met at that writer's conference. I hope you're doing well and writing. For the last year, I have been hiding behind a computer screen, anonymously giving out advice in the online column called Dear Sugar. I know you read this column because it's received exactly one fan letter, <laughs> yours. To be honest, I don't have a passion for the gig. And as you know, I admire your work. So I am brazenly emailing you with a job offer. Do you want to take over the column? I mean, do you want to be sugar? As you know, it's anonymous. So there's no credit. And the bonus is there's no pay. So, you in? <clears throat> Hello, <laughs> and thank you for your strange offer. <laughs> I'm writing a book. <laughs> My husband is an artist. I have two kids and 10 mountains of debt. And I can't possibly take on Yeah. I'm in. That's great. I'll mail you the letters. Oh. sugar. I'm so jealous of other people's success, even if I like them. When my friends get good news, oh, I put on a smile. But I'm really thinking, why not me? <laughs> I'm in a new school in the eighth grade. I want to make friends, and my dad's advice is just be yourself. But it's not that easy in a new school. Everybody has their own groups. Everyone already knows who they're going to pair up with in science class. And, and I'm stuck with this antisocial kid who picks his nose.
Dear Sugar, I'm a 77-year-old buried man, and I suspect my recently widowed neighbor is spying on me. When I'm in my yard, picking weeds, to drive her batty, I don't wear a shirt. <laughs> there, sugar. I get seasick. And I have a boat trip coming up with my boss. He doesn't like me. I mean, he really doesn't like me. I don't want to go on the trip. I, I want to call in sick and, you know, before I get on the boat and barf. What's your advice? I'm a 35 year old woman. I lost my job and I'm entering into an arrangement with a married man. We will rendezvous twice a week and he will pay me $2,000 a month. I have many thoughts and questions, including, is this taxable income? sugar. Something is different. <laughs> Who the hell are you? Hello. I'm the new sugar. I knew it. Who are you? What's your real name? Let's just keep it at sugar. You write other things? Yes. Are you a published author? Yes. As in a real book or a, or a blog? I've published some things, including a novel. So, do you write the letters for the column? No. Wait, the letters are real? Yes. All of them? Yes. Do you have an office? Is this your job? No. I write at home at night when I'm supposed to be working on my next book. Have you ever written an advice column before? Nope. Are any questions off limits? No. <laughs> Do you like it up the ass? What is your name? No. Can we really ask you anything? Yes. Let's leave it at sugar. Dear sugar, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? I'm asking this question as it applies to everything, every day. Best, W-T-F. Oh, go back to bed. <laughs> Dear Sugar, I got pregnant and my boyfriend and me, we were excited to become parents. When I was six and a half months pregnant, I miscarried. And since then, not a day has gone by when I haven't thought about who that child would have been. A girl, she had a name. Amy, and every day I wake up and think, Amy would be six months old today, or Amy maybe would be crawling today. And sometimes all I can think of is, Amy, 
Amy, Amy, over and over and over. Oh, I'm not sad or pissed off. I just don't care about anything. I'm numb and I can't get past it. Most of the people in my life expect me to have moved on by now. And one even said, it was only a miscarriage. So, so I also feel guilty about being so stuck and grieving for a child that, that never was. Then there is the reason I lost the baby. My doctor said it was because I was overweight. Well, part of me thinks the doctor was an asshole for saying that. But another part of me believes that it was my fault. Sometimes I don't eat for days. And then sometimes I eat everything in sight and throw it all up. I spend hours at the gym walking on the treadmill until I can't lift my legs. The rational part of me understands that if I don't pull myself out of this, I'll do serious damage to myself. I know this. And yet, I just don't care. Oh, sugar, I want to know how to care again. Signed, stuck. Dear stuck. Some people think they're being honest with you. Some people are scared of the intensity of your loss. None of them will help you because they live on planet Earth. You live on planet my baby died. There are many women who have spent their days silently chanting daughter, daughter, or son, son to themselves. You need to find those women. They are your tribe. The healing power of even the most microscopic exchange with someone who knows in a flash exactly what you're talking about because the same thing happened to them cannot be overestimated. Several years ago, I worked with at-risk girls in middle school. Most of them were poor, or white, in sixth or seventh grade. My job title was Youth Advocate. My mission was to help the girls succeed. Succeeding meant not getting pregnant or locked up before they graduated high school. It meant eventually holding down a job. It was such a small thing, and yet it was enormous. It was like pushing a 10, 18 wheeler with your little pinky finger. I was scared of them at first. They were 13 and I was 28. They hated everything and everything was boring and stupid and either very cool or totally gay. And I had to tell them why not to say the word gay to mean stupid. And then they thought I was a little fag. By thinking by gay, they meant gay. And then I would have to tell them not to say fad. And then I passed around journals that I had purchased for them. Do we get these? Yes, open them. I asked them each to write down three true things about themselves and one lie, and then we read them out loud, guessing which one was the lie. By the time we were halfway around the room, they all loved me intensely. <laughs> Not me, but how I held them with unconditional 
positive regard. We went to places they'd never been to, a rock climbing gym and the ballet. I hoped if they witnessed the grace of live art, they wouldn't steal someone's wallet and end up in jail. As they pulled themselves up over a fake boulder, they learned to value their bodies and they wouldn't get knocked up. Their dads were in prison or unknown to them or fucking them. And their moms were strung out in drugs or on the streets. The girls told me ghastly, merciless stories of sorrow and betrayal. One girl wore an enormous hooded sweatshirt that hung down to her knees with a hood pulled up over her head and across her face hung a dense, dense curtain of hair. It, it looked like she had two backs of a head and no face. She told me that she slept most nights in a falling down wooden shed near the alley behind the apartment building. Where she lived. She did this because she couldn't take staying inside. Where her mother ranted and raved, alcoholic and mentally ill. Another girl told me that when her mom's boyfriend got mad, he dragged me into the yard and turned on the hose and held my face up to the icy cold water until I almost drowned. And Len locked me outside for two hours. I told the girls that these things were unacceptable, illegal, that I would call someone and that this would stop. I called the police. I called Child Protection Services. And no one did anything. So I told the girls something different. This will not stop. It will go on. So you have to find a place within yourself to not only escape the shit, but to transcend it. And if you aren't able to do that, then your whole life will be shit forever and ever and ever. You have to do more than hold on. You have to reach. And the same is true for you, Stuck. And for anyone who has ever had anything terrible happen to them. How you get unstuck is you reach. Therapy and speaking with friends and support groups will help. Don't hold it inside. Get it out. Tell it out. Cry it out. But know this, nobody else can make this right for you. You have to reach for the desire to heal. And true healing is a fierce place. It's a giant place, a, a place of monstrous beauty and glimmering light. And you have to work really hard to get there. Years after I left that job, I was having lunch at a Taco Bell. Just as I was gathering up my things to leave, a woman wearing a Taco Bell hat approached and said my name. It was the faceless girl who lived in a falling down shed. Her hair was pulled back out of her face. She was grown up. Hey. Is that I you? I made it, didn't I? Oh, you did. Uh, you absolutely did. Signed, Sugar. Dear Sugar, 
The thought of staying in my marriage makes me feel panicky and claustrophobic. My, my wife and I have some things in common, but I don't think those are enough. I find myself fantasizing about sleeping with other women. I'm afraid I'm gonna get more bored as time goes on. I'm also afraid there's no one better out there for me, that I should be happy and grateful for what I have. Dear Sugar, I want to leave my marriage, but I don't want to embarrass her. I'm terrified of hurting her. She has been so good to me. I, I consider her my best friend. I think I love her, but I'm not in love with her. Dear Sugar, I feel trapped and like I'm hiding the real me. I don't blame him for my discontent, but I never wanted to get married. And now I don't know how to stop the charade. <coughs> I want out, but how? Signed, afraid to leave. Signed, I can't do this. Signed, how can I hurt him? Here all of us who want to please. There was nothing wrong with my first husband. He wasn't perfect, but he was pretty close. I met him a month after I turned 19, and I married him on a rash and romantic impulse a month before I turned 20. But there was in me an awful thing from almost the very beginning, a small, clear voice that would not, no matter what I did, would not stop saying, go. Go, even though you love him. Go, even though he's kind and faithful and dear to you. Go even though he's your best friend and you're his. So, even though your friends will be disappointed or surprised or pissed off or all three. So, even though you once said you would stay. Mm. So, even though you're afraid of being alone. So, even though you have nowhere to go. Go, because you want to, because wanting to leave is enough. Get a pen, write that last sentence on your palm, then read it over and over again until your tears are washed it away. When it came to my first marriage, I tried to be good. I tried to be bad. I was sad and scared and self-destructive. I finally cheated on my former husband because I didn't have the guts to tell him I wanted out. I loved him too much to make a clean break. So I botched the job and I made it dirty instead. Divorcing him was the most excruciating decision I ever made. But I wasn't the only one whose life was better. He deserved the love of a woman who didn't have the word. Oh whispering like a deranged ghost in her ear. We all know when we really? want to must go. I only ask, will you do it later or will you do it now? 
your sugar. Dear Sugar, we still don't know who the hell you are. And seriously, who the hell do you think you are? This week, you're telling people to leave their marriages. Last week, it was the opposite. You said, don't have an affair. What are you trying to make us do? Signed, not buying it. You're not buying it. My goal isn't to make anyone do anything. I'm offering advice based on my personal experiences. Oh, wow. Did you just make this about you? Are you a therapist? No. Are you in therapy? No. Are you even qualified for this gig? Dear Sugar, your advice is all over the place. How can you suggest in one column that we stick to convention. And then in the very next one, say that we gotta be bold. Make up your mind. Well, whatever. Why am I trying to figure you out? Do you even know who you are? Make a choice. Pick a lane. Sign, Dear. still not buying it. <laughs> You're still not buying it. Years ago, I was in a cafe with a man who's now my husband. <laughs> We'd only been lovers for a month, but we were already in deep, thick in the thrall of the, you tell me everything and I'll tell you everything because I love you so madly stage. On this day, I was telling him about my divorce. Then, my months of heroin use, which led to the tale of how I'd gotten pregnant by a heroin addict and how I felt so angry about having an abortion that I'd intentionally sliced the line in my arm with a knife. He stopped me. He said, Please, don't, don't get me wrong. I want to hear everything about your life, but I want you to know you don't need to tell me this to get me to love you. You don't have to be broken for me. I remember that moment precisely. It wasn't a good feeling. I had never realized that I thought to get a man to love me, I had to appear to be broken for him. But when he said it, I realized it. He was a man, a good, kind, compassionate man, finally calling me out. You don't have to be broken for me. I didn't have to be broken for him, even though parts of me were. I realized I could be every piece of myself. I could be vulnerable and strong, fearful, and fearless. I could be everything I was and wanted to be. And the fact that things could be valid and yet contradictions of each other was the unification of the ancient and the future parts of me. And with that moment, I was open. I was bare. I will be open with you. I will be there. I will show you my brokenness and my strengths and I will do my best to offer my best, tough, sweet, and occasionally contradicting advice. I don't know if my unorthodox approach is wrong or right. Sure. Advice columnists are supposed to position themselves as the ones who know, but I'm not that. I'm 
the one who doesn't know, but who will work really, really hard to see what I can find. This is who I am. Tell me, who are you? Sign sugar. Dear sugar. Dear sugar. Dear sugar. Dear sugar, I, I was in an accident that injured my spine, and now I'm secretly addicted to pain meds. Dear Sugar, I'm afraid of my violent older brother. He's terrorized me since we were kids. Dear Sugar, icky thoughts turn me on. I have repulsive thoughts about men taking me aggressively and me submitting to them in bed. Dear Sugar, my wife drinks while I'm at work. And when I get home, she thinks I can't tell. Dear Sugar, my daughter has a tumor and is having brain surgery tomorrow. And I find myself doubting God's existence. Dear Sugar, my birth mother doesn't want to see me. Dear Sugar, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? I'm asking this about everything, every day. Best WT. Dear Sugar, I'm 34 years old and I'm transgender. I was born a female, but for as long as I can remember, I wanted to be male. This resulted in a painful childhood, picked on by friends, so-called, and, ig and ignored by my family. Seven years ago, I told my mom and dad I wanted a sex change. They were furious. They said the worst things you can imagine anyone saying to a human being, especially if that human being is your child. In response, I cut off ties with them and I moved away and I made a new life living as a man. I have friends and romance in my life. I love my job. I'm happy with who I've become and the life I've made. After years of no contact, I got an email from my parents that blew my mind. They apologized. They, they were sorry. They never understood, and now they do. They said they miss me, and, and they want me back. I cried like crazy, and that surprised me. I believed I didn't love my parents anymore. <laughs> I've made it without them. I've, I've created an island. I'm safe here. I made it because I'm tough. Do I forgive them and get back in touch or do I ignore their email and stay safe on my island?
What do I do? Signed, Orphan. Dear Orphan, forgive your parents. Not for them, for you. You've remade yourself. You and your mom and dad can remake this too. The new era in which they are finally capable of loving the authentic you. What they did to you seven years ago is terrible. They know that now. Your parents have grown and changed and come to understanding things that confounded them before. Refusing to accept them for the people they are isn't any different from them refusing to accept you for who you are. It's not tough. It's weak. You've had to ask yourself impossible questions, endure humiliations, and uh, redefine your life in ways that most people cannot even imagine. But you know what? So of your parents. When you needed them, they were drowning in their own fear. They aren't drowning anymore. They swam to shore. They have arrived at last on your island. Welcome them, your sugar. Your sugar. Four years ago, I was raped. Anger and panic became a deep part of my life and almost dragged me under. It took a long time, but I finally pulled myself up and onward. I feel it's behind me and I'm over it. Well, I have been dating a great guy for a year and a half. We have a healthy and positive relationship. Do I tell him about my sexual assault? Do I need to? We've been through some stuff, but, but I don't know if he's capable of hearing about this. <clears throat> I, I worry it might freak him out and affect our relationship. I need your advice. Signed, why tell? Dear why tell? I asked my friend, a talented painter, how she recovered from being sexually assaulted. How she resumed having healthy sexual uh, relationships with men. How she con could continue to go on as a talented painter and live a full life. She told me that you get to decide who you allow to influence you. She said, I could allow myself to be influenced by a man who screwed me against my will, or I could allow myself to be influenced by Van Gogh. She chose Van Gogh. You chose Van Gogh too. I salute you for making your way through your experience to this side of it. But you have a secret within you. Keeping this trauma from your boyfriend doesn't let him know what a warrior you are. We need to let the people we love see what made us. Tell your boyfriend about your sexual assault. What happened? How you suffered? How you made your way through it? How you feel about it now? Tell him. Otherwise, it creates the burden of a secret that you 
you are too wonderful to keep your sugar. <coughs> Dear sugar, one of the general mysteries of life is that I don't know what something will turn out to be until I've lived through it. <laughs> Would you give us an example of something you thought was one thing uh, and then it became another? Signed, Curious. Dear Curious, the summer I was 18, I was driving down a country road with my mother when we stopped at a yard sale. There was nothing much of interest in it, and uh, I was about ready to suggest we leave when something caught my eye. <laughs> a red velvet dress trimmed with fur fit for a toddler. I was pretty sure at that moment that I would never be a mother myself. Children were fine, but ultimately annoying. I wanted more out of my life. And yet, ridiculously, inexplicably, I wanted that red dress. Something about it called powerfully to me. My mother picked it up. You want this dress for someday? But I'm not even going to have kids. You can put it in a box and then you'll have it no matter what you decide. I don't have a dollar. I do. Three years later, I'd be standing in a field not far from that yard sale holding the ashes of my mother's body in my palms. My mother was gone. The red dress was still with me, packed into a cedar box that had belonged to her. I dragged it with me all the way along the scorching trail of my 20s and into my 30s when I had two children, a son, and then a daughter. The red dress was a secret, only known by me, buried for years among my mother's best things. When I unearthed it and held it again, it was like being slapped and kissed at the same time. Like the volume was being turned way up and also way down. The two things that were both true about its existence, had an opposite effect and were yet the same single fact. My mother bought a dress for the granddaughter she'll never know. My mother bought a dress for the granddaughter, she'll never know. How beautiful, how ugly, how little, how big, how painful, how sweet. It's seldom that we can draw a direct line between this and that. My desire to buy the dress was made meaningful only by my mother's death and my daughter's birth. The dress was the material evidence of my loss, but also of the way my mother's love had carried me forth beyond her. Her life extending years into my own in ways I never could have imagined in the moment the rest dress caught my eye. And seeing my daughter on the second Christmas of her life, wearing the dress that the grandmother she'd never meet bought for her, returned something to me that I thought had been lost forever. We cannot possibly know 
what will manifest in our lives. We live and have experiences and leave people we love and get left by them. People we thought would be with us forever aren't. And people we didn't know would come into our lives too. Our work here is to keep faith with that, to put it in a box and to wait, to trust that someday we will know what it means so that when the ordinary miraculous is revealed to us, we will be there standing before the baby girl in the pretty dress, grateful for the smallest things Yours, sugar. Dear 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 sugar. If it's true that drug addicts stopped maturing at the time they started using, then the same thing happens at weddings. Dear sugar, I'm worried I'm going to die alone. Dear sugar, when it comes to holding down a job, I'm the worst. Dear sugar. I think I'm attracted to my teacher. Dear Sugar, are you there? Dear Sugar, where are you? Dear Sugar, why aren't you answering me? Dear Sugar, my roommate is selfish. Are you ever going to answer me? Dear Sugar. Dear Sugar. Kind of crazy, but my girlfriend's seriously turned on by Santa Claus. The old dude, big belly, white beard. It's hard to find out if you're naughty or nice. It just turns her on. It's our first Christmas together, and she told me about this fantasy when, fa when Santa started to pop up all over the place. She gets especially turned on when she sees an actual Santa, but starts her thinking about sitting in his lap and <laughs> what might come up. <laughs> you, you get the picture. So here's my question. My sister has two young sons, and... A couple years back, she bought a Santa suit, and I go over to her place to give my nephews a thrill on Christmas Eve. And so I had this idea. It occurred to me that if I keep the suit for a bit, I can give my girlfriend a thrill too. <laughs> Creepy? Good idea? Bad idea? What do you make of this plan? Sexy Santa. <laughs> Dear Sexy Santa, your giving spirit is genuinely what the holiday season is all about. I say, stuff that woman's stocking the way only Santa knows how. Your sugar. <laughs> Dear Sugar, I dated this girl for a while until I realized she was self-absorbed, so I dumped her. And she became one of my crazy exes. Then she had a fight with her best friend, and they stopped being friends. And, and that ex-best friend of my ex called me up to hang out, uh, and I ended up banging her. <laughs> a few days later, 
she tells me she's engaged. She wears this weird short-haired wig while she breaks up with me. The thing is, I connected better with her in the three days we hung out than I did with my ex in, in months. Please help me figure out what I should do now. Which woman I should be with. I'm not a smart man, but I do know what love is. Signed, Gump. Dear Gump, I keep politics out of this column. But just this once, let's recall when former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld quite wisely said something like, there are known knowns. These are the things we know we know. And there are known unknowns. These are the things we know we do not know. But there are also the unknown unknowns. These are the things we do not know we do not know. When it comes to your triangular quagmire, let's start with the known knowns. These are the things you know you know. A. Uh, I, I didn't want to fuck my girlfriend anymore, so I broke up with her. B. I fucked my ex-girlfriend's ex-best friend for three days. Things were good. C. She put on a wig and told me she didn't want to fuck me anymore. Which brings us to the known unknowns. The things you know, you do not know. A. How come so many of my exes are crazy? <laughs> B. Is my ex-girlfriend's ex-best friend really engaged to be married, or is she trying to shake me? C. Why the wig? Which brings us to the unknown unknowns, the things that you don't know, you don't know. A. You don't have a future with either of these women. B, neither is even thinking of you. C, and yet, you are loved. You wrote to me with your scared, searching, knuckle-headed heart on full display. It takes a lot to be that brave, and you are. So I love you. And the only advice I have to you is go find another girlfriend. Yours, Sugar. <laughs> Dear Sugar, my sister's been in hospice for six months. Dear Sugar, he said he only hired me because he was attracted to me. Uh, Dear Sugar, my two sons, aged 35 and 31, have returned to the nest, my home. They didn't ask. Dear Sugar, I was born with a rare blood disease. It's left me with physical deformities. Dear Sugar, what the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? What the fuck? I'm asking this question as it applies to everything, every day. Best WTF. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Dear Sugar, my father was a narcissist, controlling, vain, volatile, and charming. If I wasn't cheerful enough, I was locked in my room for days. If I made a joke, he'd yell and curse at me. My father would denounce me as his child over the slightest disagreements. When he decided that everything was fine again, I was expected to accept his change of heart. 
no apologies offered unless they were mine. I never could be perfect enough. And yet I tried so hard to make him proud, to make him care. He was my dad after all. Still, now as an adult, it's not better. He's so consumed by his image that when he found out that my, my counselor, a, a kind, understanding, sympathetic woman that he knew, and he insisted I stop seeing her. But three months ago, he went too far. He betrayed my mother, and I was an SOB for finding out about his infidelity. People insist that family is important, that it's my duty to forgive the man who gave me life and to try to keep him in my life. He's the only father I have. But is it worth the pain? Signed, what is too much, too much? You're too much. No. Maintaining a relationship with your abusive father is not worth it. Yes, he's the only father you'll ever know, but that does not give him the right to abuse you. The standard you should apply in deciding whether or not to have an active relationship with him is the same standard you should apply to all the relationships in your life. You will not be mistreated or disrespected or manipulated. Your father does not currently meet that standard. My mother left my father because he'd been violent and abusive. I haven't had parents as an adult, and yet I carry them with me every day. They are like having two empty bowls. I've had to repeatedly fill on my own. I think your father will have the same effect on you. Even if you cut off these ties with your dad, you won't fully escape him. He will be the empty bowl that you will have to fill again and again. After my mother died, I wrote a letter to my dad saying that for me to have a relationship with him, he would have to explain why he had done the things he'd done. He never wrote back. 17 years passed. And then one day the phone rang and, and there it was, my father's name on the screen of my telephone. Hello? Hello? Do you watch Rachel Ray? Ra Rachel Ray? Yeah, you know, Rachel Ray, the cookbook writer. She has a talk show. Uh, yeah. And so it went. The most flabbergasting conversation I've ever had. My father spoke to me as if we spoke every week, as if nothing that had happened had happened, as if my whole childhood didn't exist. The topics were uh, recipes, poodles, cataracts, sunscreen. I got off the phone 15 minutes later, utterly bewildered. He wasn't ill or delusional. He was my father talking to me as if I was his daughter, as if he had the right, but he didn't. For all those years without him in my life, I always thought of my dad on my birthday, how on the day I was born, he must have held me in his hands and thought his baby was a miracle. He must have believed he could be a better person than he'd been before. 
a few days after that phone call, he sent me a chatty note over email. When I replied, I said what I'd said to him in the letter I'd written 17 years before, that I would consider having a relationship with him only after he had spoken about our shared past. He replied, inquiring what it was I wanted to know. I wrote the most loving, painful, and forgiving letter of my life. And then I pressed send. My father's reply came in so quickly, it seemed impossible that he'd read the whole thing. In enraged words, he wrote that I should never contact him again and that he was glad to be finally rid of me. I didn't cry. I laced on my running shoes and walked out the front door of my house and through my neighborhood to a park and up a big hill. I didn't stop walking until I got all the way to the top. And then I sat down on a bench that looked over the city. I had that feeling you get, there's no word for that feeling. When you are simultaneously happy and sad and angry and grateful and accepting and appalled at every other possible emotion all smashed together and amplified. Why is there no word for this feeling? I sat for so long on that bench, looking up at the sky and the land and the trees, thinking, my father. My father. He is finally, finally, finally rid of me. Perhaps healing is the word and we don't want to believe that. We want to believe the word healing is more pure and perfect. Like a baby on its birthday. And when we're holding it in our hands, we'll be better people than we were before. Like we have to be. Your sugar. Hmm. Dear Sugar, can you ever read the comments after, after you've posted a response to a letter? I am a writer posting things online, so I try to avoid reading the comments. Yes, I read all the comments. I wanted to tell you that I had this hot dream about you, even though I don't know what you look like. If your hair is straight or curly, or if you're curvy or skinny. But it didn't matter because you were a woman and we were getting down. Okay. <laughs> Come on, sugar. Who are you? It's driving me crazy. I want to know. What would a photograph of you look like? A woman standing naked in the light of day. She's flawed, but she's okay with that. Her hands are obscuring her face. You see everything else. But, but why can't we see that one thing? Why can't we see your face and know who you are? You know who I am. I reveal myself to you in every column. If you had to give one piece of advice to people in their 20s, what would it be? Be about 10 times more generous than you believe yourself capable of being. Why? Because in your 20s, you're becoming who you're going to be. And you might as well not become an asshole. <laughs> What's something weird that's happened to you? Something weird. Well, one 
time, I was hiking up a mountain on a trail with a little bit of snow on it in New Mexico. There was no one around for hours until I ran into two people, a man and a woman who had just met each other. We were three strangers on a mountain. Uh, we, we got to talking and found out that we all had the same birthday. And not only that, we were born in three consecutive years. And as we were talking, three feathers blew up to us on the snow. We picked them up. That was weird. I was wondering, could you please tell us some of the dumb things you've done? Heroin. <laughs> Meth. The withdrawal method. <laughs> a blowjob by a lake. Oh. An idiot punk at a Beastie Boys concert. That's a piece of advice you've given, you know, that's taken you some time to learn. If the word forgiveness is written on one side of a coin, on the other side is written the word no. No is golden. It's the good kind of power. It's the way emotionally evolved people live their lives. It's the way to set boundaries. No means you're choosing what to share. Will you tell us your name? No. Will you ever tell us your name? Yes. Names are names. It doesn't matter to me who you are. What I want to know, where did you get that big heart? From my mother. Hmm. From my father from a crack in the sidewalk where a flower grew, from the blow job by the lake, from the lake. I'm saying yes to strange offers from all of you. Dear Sugar, for many years I stole compulsively. I blame myself, even though I was on a cocktail of psychotropic drugs, for insomnia, for depression, for anxiety. I stole a pair of jeans from a friend, flower pots from a neighbor money from a girlfriend's wallet. I blame myself, even though I grew up with an abusive mother screaming at me that I was a liar, a cheat, and a thief. I was not only trying to fulfill my mother's prophecy, but, but maybe I was trying to get people to hate and reject me for being a liar, a cheat, and a thief. I hate myself, loathe myself for what I've done. I wonder if I should confess to the friends who will surely reject me. Sugar, can I forgive myself without admitting to people how I wronged them? Please help. Signed, Thief. Dear Thief, on a warm spring day several years ago, I saw I was down to my last 20 cents. So I put nearly everything I owned out on the lawn, my thrift store dresses, my knickknacks and dishes. Customers came and went, 
throughout the day, but my primary companions were a group of 11-year-old boys who flittered about acquiring how much this and that cost, even though they didn't have any money to purchase. Late in the day, they told me one of the boys had stolen something from me, an empty retro leather camera case that I'd once used as a purse. It was a small thing, a, a barely worth bothering about item that would have sold for only a couple of bucks. But still, I asked the accused boy if he'd taken it. No! The next day, he returned wearing a big white shirt. When he thought I wasn't looking, he pulled the camera case from underneath the shirt and he placed it where it had been sitting the day before. Your thing is back. Good. Why'd you steal it? I didn't. It was a sunny day. A few of the boys sat with me on the porch steps, telling me about their lives. The boy who'd stolen my camera case showed me his bicep and insisted in a tone more belligerent than the others that the chains he wore around his neck were real gold. Why'd you steal my camera case? I didn't. I, I just took it while I went home to get money. The day went by, and soon it was just the two of us. He told me about the mother he rarely saw and his much older siblings, about the kind of hot car he was going to buy the instant he turned 16. Why'd you steal my camera case? Be because I was lonely. <laughs> oh, there are only a few times anyone has been so self-aware and nakedly honest as that boy was with me in that moment. When he said what he said, <laughs> I almost fell up the steps. Perhaps because when he told me about himself, he told me something about myself. I used to steal things too. I took a compact of blue eyeshadow from a cousin. I stole a pretty sweater from a classmate. A figurine of a white dog with his head askew. I didn't know why I stole things, and I still can't properly say, but because I was lonely, seems about the rightest thing I ever heard. I think you're lonely too, and loneliness isn't a crime. I don't think the path to wholeness is walking backwards up the trail. The people who stole from you don't need you to fess up. But you're so very invested in your self-loathing. If you perpetually condemn yourself for being a liar and a thief, does that make you good? I don't like the thief part of my narrative either. I struggled with whether or not I should talk about it in here. It's the first time I've written about it ever. I've written about all sorts of other bad things I've done. Promiscuous sex, drugs. This seems worse. But this is who I am. This is who you are. Can we forgive ourselves? Years after I stopped stealing, I was sitting alone by a river. I found myself thinking about all the things I'd taken. And before I even knew what I was doing, I began picking a blade of grass for each one and then dropping it into the water. I am forgiven, I thought, as I let go of the blade that stood for the blue eye shadow. I am forgiven, I thought, for the pretty sweater. I am forgiven. For the dog figurine, 
and so on and so on until I'd let all the bad things I'd done float right down the river and I'd said, I am forgiven. So many times it felt like I actually was. That doesn't mean I never grappled with it again. You have to say, I am forgiven over and over until it becomes a story you believe about yourself. Every last one of us has the capacity to do that, you included. I hope you will. I don't know whatever became of that lonely boy at my yard sale. I hope he's made right whatever was wrong inside of him. When I closed down the sale, camera case he'd stolen from me was still sitting there. I held it out to him. You want this? Yes, please. It's yours. Thank you. Sugar. Dear Sugar, one, it's taken me many weeks to compose this letter, and even still, I can't do it right. The only way I can get it out is to make a list instead of write a letter. Two, I don't have a definite question for you. I'm a sad, angry woman whose son died. I want him back. That's all I ask for, and it's not a question. Three, nearly four years ago, a drunk driver drove through a red light and hit my son at full speed. The dear boy that I love more than life itself was dead before the paramedics got to him. He was 22, my only child. Four, I'm a mother while not being a mother. Most days, it feels like my grief is going to kill me or maybe it already has. I'm a living, dead mom. Five, your column has helped me to go on. I, I have faith in my version of God and I pray every day and the way I feel when I'm in my deepest prayer is the way I feel when I read your words. Six, I see a psychologist regularly and I'm not clinically depressed or on medication. Seven, suicide has occurred to me, but I can't do it because it would be a betrayal of my values and also of the values I instilled in my son. Eight, I have good friends who are supportive and family too. And even my ex-husband and I have become close friends again after our son's death. Nine, I have a good job and my health. 10, I'm going on with things in a way that make it appear like I'm adjusting to life without my son. But the fact is, I'm living a private hell. 11, sometimes the pain is so great. I simply lie in my bed and wail. 12, I can't stop thinking about my son. 13, I can't stop thinking about the things my son would be doing now and all the things we did together when he was young. 14, 
I hate the man who killed my son. For his crime, he was incarcerated for only 18 months and then released. He wrote a letter of apology, but I barely scanned it. I ripped it into pieces and threw it in the garbage. 15. I fear you will choose not to answer my letter because you haven't lost a child. 16. I, I fear if you choose to answer my letter, people will make critical comments about you, be saying you don't have the right to speak to this matter because you have not lost a child. I pray you will never lose a child. 18. I will understand if you choose not to answer my letter. Most people, kind as they are, don't know what to say to me. So why should you? 19. I'm writing to you because the way you have written about your grief over your mother dying so young has been meaningful to me. 20. What can you say to me? 21. <coughs> How do I go on? 22. How do I become human again? Signed, Living Dead Mom. Dear Living Dead Mom. One. I don't know how you go on without your son. I only know that you do, and you have, and you will, too. Your shattering letter is proof of that. Three, <laughs> you don't need me to tell you how to be human. You're there in all of your humanity, shining unimpeachably before every person reading these words right now. Four. I am so sorry for your loss. I am so sorry for your loss. I am so sorry for your loss. Five. You could stitch together a quilt with all the times that that has been said and will be said to you. You could make a river of consolation birds. I won't bring your son back. You won't keep that man from getting into his car and careening through that red light at the precise moment your son was in his path. Six, you'll never keep that man from getting into that car. Seven, Will you peel back the rage and you peel back the thoughts of suicide? And you peel back the man who got into that car. At the center of that, there is your pure mother love that is stronger than anything. Eight, no one can touch that love or alter it or take it away from you. Your love for your son belongs only to you. Nine. Small things have saved me. How much I love my mother, even after all these years. How powerfully I carry her within me. My grief is tremendous. 
but my love is bigger. So is yours. You're not grieving your son's death because his death was ugly and unfair. You're grieving it because you loved him truly. Your beauty in that is greater than the bitterness of his death. 10. I keep imagining you lying on your bed and wailing. I keep thinking that hard as it is to do, it's time for you to go silent and lift your head from the bed and listen to what's there in the wake of your wail. 11. It's your life. The one you must make in the obliterated place that's now your world. Where everything you used to be is simultaneously erased and omnipresent. Where you are forever a living, dead mom. 12. A literal translation of the word obliterate is being against the letters. It was impossible for you to write me a letter, so you made me a list instead. 13. The obliterated place is equal parts destruction and creation. The obliterated place is pitch black and it is bright light. It is water and it is parched earth. It is mud and it's manna. The work of deep grief is making a home there. 14. More will be revealed. Your son hasn't yet taught you everything he has to teach you. He taught you how to love like you'd never loved before. He taught you how to suffer like you never suffered before. Perhaps the next thing he has to teach you is acceptance. And what comes after that? Forgiveness. 15. Forgiveness bellows from the bottom of the canoe. There are stories you'll learn if you're strong enough to travel there. And one of them might cure you. 16. We say, I can't go on. Instead of saying, we hope we won't have to. You have the power to withstand this sorrow. We all do. 17. We go on by doing the best you can. You go on by being generous. You go on by offering comfort to others who can't go on. You go on by allowing the unbearable days to pass and allowing the pleasure in other days. You go on by finding a channel for your rage and another for your love. 18. When my son was six, he said people die at all ages. He said it without fear or anguish. It has been a healing for me to accept in a very simple way that my mother's life was 45 years long, that there was nothing beyond that. 19. When you say you experience my writing is sacred, what you are touching is the place within me that is my mother. Sugar is the temple I built in my obliterated place. I give it all back, but the fact is grief taught me things. It required me to suffer. It compelled me to reach. 20, your grief has taught you too, living dead mom. Your son was your greatest gift in his life and he is your greatest gift in his death too. Receive it. Let your dead son be your most profound revelation. 
22. Think. My son's life was 22 years long. Breathe in. 22. Think. My son's life was 22 years long. Breathe out. 23. There is no 23. 24. Create something of him. <laughs> Make it beautiful. <laughs> Yours, sugar. Dear Sugar, I heard you're soon going to reveal your real name. Is this true? Will we finally know who you are? Kind, hopeful. <laughs> Dear Hopeful, there is a common assumption that by not revealing my name, I'm protecting my privacy or it's freeing to write anonymously. But what is freeing is that you can re read my responses without the barriers of whatever preconceptions you might have about my age or ethnicity or achievements. Not knowing my name allows you to have a more pure vision of me. When I took on sugar, I wrote the only way I know how, and that is with radical sincerity and open arms. What has been the most surprising is how much you all gave back to me. You, you gave me love. Love, 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 love. So much love. Your stories spilled into mine and mine spilled back into yours. Sugar is not just me. We created something together. We are all sugar. I know you, and you know me. I reveal the most intimate details of my life, and so keeping my name a secret is no longer important. My name is Cheryl Strait. Yes, I am sugar. And so are all of you. Yours, sugar. Dear Sugar, I've been wanting to ask you something. My question is pretty simple. It's something I wonder about. What advice would you give your younger self? Love you. Dear younger me, stop worrying about whether you're fat. You're not fat. Well, actually, you're a little fat, but who gives a shit? Feed yourself. The people you love will love you more for it. The adults that you think were old and stupidly saddled with kids and cars and houses were once every bit as hip and pompous as you. <laughs> in the middle of the night, in the middle of your 20s, when a friend crawls naked into oh. your bed and straddles you and says, you should run away from me before I devour you. Believe her. <laughs> Don't lament so much about how your career is going to turn out. You don't have a career. You have a life. <laughs> Keep the faith. Do the work. The useless days will add up to something. 
the shitty waitressing jobs, the writing in your journal, the long meandering walks, the hours spent reading poetry and novels and dead people's diaries and wondering about sex and God and whether you should shave under your arms or not. These things are your becoming. And that sweet but fucked up gay couple invite you over to their cool house to do ecstasy with them? They know. You cannot convince people to love you. That's an absolute rule. Real love moves freely in both directions like children at play. Don't waste your time on anything else. Most things will be okay eventually, but not everything will be. Sometimes you'll put up a good fight and lose. Sometimes you'll hold on hard and realize there's no choice but to let go. Acceptance is a small, quiet room. The night you meet a man in the doorway of a Mexican restaurant who later kisses you while explaining that his kiss doesn't mean anything because much as he likes you, he's not interested in a relationship right now. Just kiss him, just laugh and kiss him back. Your daughter will have his sense of humor. Your son will have his eyes. There are some things you can't understand yet. Your life will be a great and continuous unfolding. You will come to know things that can only be known with the wisdom of age and the grace of years. Most of these things will have to do with forgiveness. On Christmas, at the beginning of your 20s when your mother gives you a warm coat that she saved for months to buy. Don't look at her skeptically after she tells you she thought the coat was perfect for you. Don't hold it up and say it's longer than you want your coats to be and too puffy uh. and possibly too warm. Your mother will be dead by spring. That coat will be the last gift she gave you. For the rest of your life, you will regret the small thing you did not say. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. During the era in which you've gotten yourself ridiculously tangled up with heroin, you will be riding the bus one late afternoon and thinking, what a worthless piece of crap you are. A little girl will get on the bus holding the strings of two purple balloons. She'll offer you one of the balloons, but you won't take it because you believe you no longer have a right to such tiny, beautiful things. You're wrong. You do. Mm. Yours, sugar. Thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed the play. And here are the people who made it happen. Letter writer one, Reed Sullivan. Letter writer two, Marcia Witzwurzen. Letter writer three, Dale Klon. And Sugar, Courtney Flanagan. Our special effects team, Siobhan and Lily Madison. Uh, the hand, because they've given us two arms, <laughs> and the very special and amazing text, Larry Carter, 
and Jim Wurtson. And I'm Bev Fremont, the director. Have a good day and be safe, all of you. Thank you again.